Hello everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, and maybe even good evening if if you really want want to uh, join us today. How are we all doing? Hope we're all well. Um, if you've been living under a rock and haven't seen any of our live streams for the past, what, Spence, do you reckon 10 weeks? Probably approaching 10 weeks, I'd yeah. say, yeah. You know, so my name is Richard Stubbley. I'm a process specialist um, for Fusion 360 based out of the Birmingham office over here in the UK. Um, but we're all working from home at the moment, of course. And we've got Spence on the line as well. Yeah, hi everyone, Spencer Hardcastle, uh, process specialist, same as Rich, working from home, of course, these days, um, based in the north of the UK, and uh, glad to be in another live stream with you, Rich. Yeah, no, it's, uh, we actually had Paolo on last week, because you were, you were down sunny south, and uh, enjoying a bit of time off, so yeah, and um, yeah. Absolutely. I hope everyone's there. Um, if you can hear us, I hope so. Please let us know. Um, we had a couple of audio issues a few weeks ago. By audio issues, I was a bit of a, a numpty and managed to get my microphone teetering against my screen so it kept banging against the screen and annoying all of you. So please shout up if that happens because I can fix it in the live stream. I can't fix it the day after. So please let us know. I hope you can hear us all loud and clear today. Have we got... E. Allen Ice Cream 62 on the line, Spence, and who made it in first? E. Al is there. <laughs> Don't know about ice cream yet. Ooh, um, so the prize goes to E. Al this week. Yeah, he's he's tagged ice cream as well. So <laughs> maybe a secret competition going on as to who would who would arrive first. Yeah. But the. Uh, we, they can hear us, which is good news, and the audio sounds good. So. Oh, that's good to hear. Thanks, everyone. Um, we do try and do this as best as we can. Um, we've got, hopefully, all the kit to do it with, but sometimes it's our human error that, that's, that's the problem, not necessarily the kit. Um, what's everyone been doing? What's everyone been making? Be interesting to know in the chat. Same format as always. I'll babble on until Spencer interrupts me. Um, and, yeah, we'll go from there, really. So, thanks everyone, and we might as well dive straight into it. So, cutter compensation. So, where did this idea come from? Um, I got asked last week or the week before to do a little bit more about G-codes, and it's a bit difficult because, of course, I'm trying to make these Fusion-related, so I can't just give you a G-code lesson because I'll get told off for not mentioning Fusion in it. Um, so, I thought, how can I, how can I join the two? And I thought about cutter comp. So, cutter comp is something that... I actually didn't use quite a lot at the, my apprenticeships and, and starting in manufacturing. Um, but then when I really did start to use it, I saw the benefit of it immediately. And, and now it's pretty much the basis on anything I'm trying to make accurately, effectively, I, I use Cutter Comp to do so. So please in the chat, let us know, do you use Cutter Comp? Have you ever had any problems with Cutter Comp? I'll explain a funny problem. I, well, funny wasn't funny, but a problem I had with Cutter Comp. Um, and yeah, let us know what your experiences are, and also just let us know if you're here to learn what is cutter comp because it might help me slow down and explain some of the basics a little bit more. So if I start talking about tool tables, I hope you all know what I mean. If you don't, shout up, and I will go quickly over what a tool table is on the controller. But quickly, it is just a table like an excel table that describes the cutter's geometry in its most basic form so this will be length and radius of the cutter so why do we need to know the length that's because of how the machine knows how long the tool is and why do we need to know the radius that's for this cutter comp depending on what machine you've got you might be using length compensation without even realizing it it's pretty much standard on most sort of commercial grade equipment. On my little Gerbil machine downstairs, I don't have Cutter Comp active on there. I think I could probably get it to work if I wanted to spend the time doing so, um, but I just haven't. So what I have to do on my machine downstairs is effectively set my datum for every um, tool I'm doing. So every time I have to change my tool, I have to reset my datum, which... A is an absolute nightmare and a pain, but also really reduces the accuracy of the parts I can make. So that's why we have length cutter compensation. 
and then we have radius cutter compensation as well. So basically we've got a big table with the length and then the radius. And then again, depending on what your controller you've got, you might have the length and then the wear of the length and then the radius and then the wear of the radius as well. So that's effectively what a tool table is and why we've got them. Is everyone happy, Spence? Everyone following? Yeah. Uh, ER would like you to start from the basics, please. Cool. That's fine. Uh, I'll get back a little bit. Carl is here to learn. Uh, so it's good to have Carl back. Carl's, Carl's a bit of a regular. Yeah, actually, I know Carl, yeah. Rob Parsons. I'm uh, not sure whether you've uh, joined before, but it's good to have you on, on another live stream. So... Uh, yeah, let's let's hear you in the chat. What have you been using Fusion for? Where are you based? Let's get a nice conversation going, and 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 Rich can uh, teach us all. I'm here to learn as well. Teach us cool. all about. Uh, okay, well, um, I'm going to try and go again. Try and go as back to basics as I can. Please, please shout up in the chat if you're not understanding. If I've skipped over something, and I'll happily go back and describe it. So quickly, while I'm on this slide. There are different G-codes to activate and deactivate the cutter compensation, be it length or be it radius. So the top ones we see there are for the radius compensation. So G40 is to cancel, 41 is to apply it on the left, 42 is to apply it on the right. I'm going to show you what those are, don't worry about those. G43 is to apply the cutter length negative. If you use it, you probably use this one without knowing. I've never seen anyone actually need G44. It just tends to be the way we define machines with the Z pointing down. But if you did want to know, you can apply the length in the inverse direction as well back up. And then 49 is to cancel that cutter compensation. So those are the G codes behind everything we're discussing today. But we'll look at those as we go through the sections. But as a rough overview, that's... Those are all the codes that we're going to be looking at today. So, the length. So you can see there, I've got four tools, all of different lengths. And you can see that they're all the same height at the top. So imagine you put those into your spindle of your machine. All your machine knows, really, is where its spindle is. So it knows that spindle length there. It doesn't know how long the tool is beneath it. We have to tell it how long that tool is. And that is in the tool table. So you can see there my little triad at the bottom, the little Z and X. So you imagine you go in and you set up your G54 at that point there. And then you need to tell the machine how long the tool is so it knows where to cut. So imagine if you had all those different tools and you didn't set the cutter compensation for the length. You'd set it up first, your, your Z point. And if your tools get smaller as they go on, you would have exactly what happens in that picture there. And the machine head would be at the same level, but your tool would be shorter. So effectively, you wouldn't cut the part over and over again if you're trying to get those all at the same Z level. So what we need to do is we need to have a value somewhere in the tool table that tells the machine how long our tool is so it knows it always moves the head to the right position to get the tip of your tool to let's just say Z0 for this. this. But you know, it's, it's going to be whatever Z value the NC code needs. But if we just look at Z0, it's going to move the machine head to the right position to get the tool tip at Z0. I hope that was roughly understandable. Did you understand that, Spence? I did, yeah. So... You're basically adjusting the length of the tool on the machine. Yep. Uh, to make sure that everything cuts correctly. Yeah, so you might think that I've defined the tool length in Fusion. Why do I need to define it on the machine? Well, Fusion, you're defining the tool length for simulation. We don't actually give um, the controller that value because it tends to be a bit of an approximation depending on how much time you spend in modeling up your tools in Fusion. There is a, but there is a definitive tool table on the machine that holds this information. But again, if you haven't got a tool table, if you don't use the tool table, then you have to set the datum for every tool you use. I mean, again, so a little bit, when I first started my apprenticeship, we had a machine and 
looking back, I reckon we just didn't know how to use it properly. But we didn't use the tool table. We said it was broken and it didn't work. Um, I was too young and naive to ask why. But we had to effectively program the... We, we used to hand code everything back then. So we, if we had one tool that faced the part at, at Z0, so that was our tool one and we used to date them with that tool. If we had the next tool come in that was 10 mil shorter, we'd have to actually hand code Z minus 10 to try and cut the same plane because we'd have to move the machine down to make the difference in this tool length. So it was a really horrible way of programming and we shouldn't have done it. Um, so that's why you, if you've got a tool table, use it. It makes your life so much easier. Because, you know, if you ran tool 1 go to Z0, tool 2 go to Z0, tool 3 go to Z0, they should all go to exactly the same point. And that's because they know how long the tools are. Again, the machine knows where its spindle is. It doesn't know the tool on the additional length from there. So if we have a quick look at the NC code on the, on the left hand side. We can see line N25, T1M6. Um, again, guess what it is? Tool number one, M6 is the macro command to put tool one in the spindle. Um, S12000M3, spindle on at 12,000 RPM. G54, activate the G54 coordinate system. M8, coolant on. G0, X minus 8, Y1, rapid to X minus 8, Y minus 1. Now we get to our important line, N50. So G43 is activate the cutter compensation in the negative direction. And I want you to go to Z15 while applying the tool length H1. So H1 is just height one so the the length of tool one so in fusion what you might see we'll have a look at this later when you've got your um, post processor tab on your tool dialog you've got a tool name and then you've got length offset and diameter offset as well usually these are the same value but you go, do get into scenarios where you have different values for the actual tool number and then the compensation points but let's just argue for today that the tool number is always going to be the same as the compensation number so h1 because i've got tool one in the spindle so go to z15 and apply the cutter comp for um tool offset one so that's what it's going to do it's going to move the machine to Z15, but it's going to honour the length of that tool. If you didn't, then in theory, if you've set your machine up right, your spindle nose would go to Z15, which might plough through the table or through the part. I really hope this is all clear. If it's not, please say I don't want to be babbling on for a half an hour, an hour, and people not following me. So hopefully that is clear about why we need the tool length, where the values come from, and then, you know, how it gets applied. So if anyone's interested in looking at these values, there's something called a gauge point on a machine. So if I take a BT40 machine, for example, so that's quite a standard um, spindle nose taper. So if you've got quick release tooling that you can pop in and out the spindle, you'll have a taper and a pull stud. And then it's actually a specific point on that taper that's called the gauge point. It's normally actually some, some like a calculation. It's floating in thin air. It's a diameter on a cone. And then it's taken from there all the way down to the tool tip. And that's where the tool length comes from. But for argument's sake, you can just say it's from the, the bit of metal under the spindle down to the tool length. Go on, Spence. What, how are we doing? I've got a couple of questions for you. Go for it. Um, so... Is this primarily used with automatic tool changes? Okay. That's a question from Greg. That's question one. Let's keep going though, and I'll think of more in case uh, I've answered two in one. And does it depend on the type of holder? So tools in holders rather than a collet? Okay, that's fine. So answer the first, is there any more spent? Sorry for running ahead. There's one more uh, from Carl actually. So he's obviously got a DIY CNC router. Yeah. Uh, with a spindle that uses an ER collet. Okay. Um, is it worth using tool tables? 
Uh, with the manual tool change and ER collets, I would think it's difficult to guarantee tool length. Yeah, okay, perfect. I've got all the answers to those. So first one, is it used only for automatic tool changes? No, it's not, but it's pretty much only used where you can remove the tool set it aside and then put another tool in. So to answer the second question from Carl about the ER collets, um, for example, on my machine, I've got ER collets as well. Because you've got to physically take the tool out um, and then put a new tool in, you're right, you're not gonna get it back in at the same place. So there is no point having the tool table because you'll need to reset the tool every time you change it anyway. So yes, they can be used with manual tool changes, but only when you can really remove the whole tool and then put another tool back in again um, so yeah so they can be used in manual tool changing but then of course if you start having this problem where you've got to physically take you know the bit of the tool out that can be put in a different position I mean what you could do if you really wanted to Carl is you could actually again, it's not be very accurate but I have seen people do this in the past is if you if you want to push the tool all the way into the top of the tool holder then you're going to have some form of certainty that the tool length might be consistent if you take that tool out and put the next tool in again. But no, really good point. And I forgot, Spence, what was the middle question? Um, yeah, Colle, uh, is it worth using tool tables? Yeah, you've said that. Uh, manual tool changes, yeah, Colle, it's exactly the same. Automatic tool changes. I thought there was a middle uh, question that I've missed. And holders rather than a collar. There is another question that I actually forgot to ask you. So we use this perfect example. Um, how does this relate to using a touch plate? Is a uh, question from EL. Okay, so thanks, EL. Um, effectively, a, a touch plate for your tool is going to be setting the tool length, really. This is exactly what it's going to do. Um, th there's two ways it's configured. One of them, it might just move your G54 datum to that length or the other one it might actually have so rather than a tool table it will just have one parameter for tool length and it will just update that one length every time so rather here where I've got you know h1 to reference number one um, it will just be the same parameter over and over again I've the, the G code I've got here is standard ISO so FANUC and anything that's based from that sort of standard ISO has Makino you name it. Um, yours might be different, so I can't cover everyone's in this. But have a look at your manuals or online forums about how to apply tool length for your specific one. So imagine EL that your machine, if you've got a touch plate, what it will probably do is set the tool length individually every time you put a new tool in. I imagine that's how yours has worked, but I'm I'm just guessing there without really seeing how it's working. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Rich. Cool. Again, shout up if I've missed anything or forgotten anything or if I'm going too fast, too slow. Right. Cutter compensation at left and right. This is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So look at the, the, the commands first. You've got G40 to cancel. G41 is apply it left. G42 is to apply it right. So what does that really mean is the machine thinks in its spindle center line. So, you know, it looks down its spindle center line and that's where all its coordinates come from. Anyone would know this if you've ever used like a, a touch probe or something or a just a, a bit, bit of stock or a, a ground bar to touch against the side of a part to set the zero. You then need to subtract the radius because the machine thinks in its center line. It doesn't think about the edge of the cutter. But the problem here is, well, we machine with the edge of the cutter. So our machine is not thinking about what it's doing, if that makes sense. The machine's thinking about its center line and happily trotting along, but actually it's the edge of the cutter that's doing the cutting. So cutter compensation is a way about letting the machine think about the edge of the tool rather than the center line of the tool. And this is brilliant because that is a value in a table, it means we can tweak that and we can actually move it. So let's say I machine a 40 millimeter square block and I then measure that. If I see that it's actually coming out at, let's say 42 millimeters, 
I know that I can then adjust that value by one millimeter because it's two sides and I can bring that part in to measure perfectly 40. Whereas of course, fusion, if it outputs the center line of the spindle, that's all it's gonna ever cut. So this is an amazing way of being able to actually adjust on the fly the, the, the tool path that's going to be executed. Does that make sense, Spence? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. That's fine then. Um, again, people please shout up because this took me a far too long to get my head round. We actually used to make um, components for Jaguar Land Rover and there was a weird oval slot we had to make. Um, and that was my first ever experience to cut a compensation was to get this like oval slot machine correctly because we had a lot of deflection on the tool that did it. So although it's called tool wear, it's amazing for just doing general compensation. To be honest, it's probably more useful for deflection than wear because when tools wear, they don't really wear in the diameter. They tend to get blunt and then deflect more, but that's a whole other conversation about compensating for deflection. But what, what, what I had to do was get a system where the operator on the machine, on the night shift, for example, you know, could measure that oval hole, go, it's too small, and then could adjust one value and bring that oval hole back into size. Because, you know, you, you just couldn't start calculating the arcs to try and adjust the NC code manually. So the two types of compensation, left and right. So G41 is apply the cutter compensation to the left. So the way I think of this is if I'm looking straight ahead and I'm cutting along my right hand side, I am to the left of where I am cutting. I hope that makes sense. So if you are the tool and you stand on the left hand side and you're cutting along your right, you have been applied to the left. If it's the other way around and you're cutting on your left hand side, you've been applied to the right. So I know that's saying left and right in the same sentence, but did you get that Spence? I think so, yeah. So in my head, this always relates to climbing conventional milling. Yeah, good, good, good idea. Okay, yeah, yeah, I suppose it does. Yeah, because the way I think of it uh, is as, you know, are, are you the tool on the left or the right-hand side of the line you are cutting? So if you look there at the picture, G41, the tool is going in that direction, and the tool is on the left-hand side of that line. If you look at G42, the tool is going in that direction, and the tool is on the right hand side of that line. So that's how you define it. And the big one there is let me just jump into fusion for a second. And let me let me look at this line here. So we'll show you more of this later. But you see here that there's the standard toolpath for in computer. The the blue line of course is the center line of the tool that it will follow. So there it doesn't need to know which side of that line it's cutting, it's just going to follow that with the centre line. Here within control, it needs to know, is it going to put the tool on the left hand side of that line or the right hand side of that line? Because Fusion is going to output this blue line here and then we need to tell the controller which side of that line are we going to put the tool. Okay. Again, please hope this is making sense or else there's probably some very confused people out there at the moment if I'm just babbling on. Um, and then how do we apply that? So if we look at the NC code, let's go straight down to line 125. So once I have done my move down to the plane and I'm going to do the lead in and lead out move, it's effectively going G41 put the cutter on the left hand side of this line so it's saying I want you to end up uh, x 6.5 y 6.5 and then it will be a big long line after there but we'll have a look at the NC code I've got it in the next slide on but then most importantly you've got d1 so the the, the radius or the diameter it's a bit difficult for me to say radius and diameter here because it depends on how your machine's configured um, it will be there it'll be obvious it will just say radius or diameter 
So D1 here um, is obviously standing for diameter on this on, on this compensation value. Sometimes it's radius, sometimes it's diameter, but it will say at the top of your tool table. But the important one there is it's using D1. So again, the value that corresponds to one, in this case we're using tool one. So we had T1, H1, and D1. So all the same values, nice and easy. But that's gonna tell it the amount it needs to move over by. So if we think back a step, if we don't use compensation, fusion output's a straight line. If we do use compensation, fusion output's another straight line, but then the machine needs to know how far to offset the tool to then cut again. Because the machine always thinks in its center line. Even if you don't output the center line from fusion, if you use compensation, the machine then needs to think in the center line because that's, that's all it knows. I'm worried I've lost people, Spence. What, what are we thinking? How are people getting on? No, I think you're there, I think. Um... Um, Omkar and Rob were originally thinking that uh, it only applied to going around corners. Okay. Um, sharp corners, but I think with that second explanation there, you've uh, you've covered it. Um, and then someone called Based Bidoof. I hope mm -hmm. I'm saying that right. Um, he's basically saying he thinks he understands it you're only using the right half of the tool, which of course the tool's rotating, so you're using the whole tool. Yeah. But you're on you're just on the right or the left hand side, therefore you're cutting with the right hand side of the machine, I guess. Yeah. You know, th think of it as the side that's that's producing the finished side. Because again you could do a full slot, in which case both sides are cutting, but it's what's making like the finished side, the side you care about. Yeah. Cool. Okay, yeah, that's it. So I think let, let me keep going, and hopefully I've gonna got some more examples. But I'm just trying to sort of lay the groundwork, and then we'll keep explaining. But please tell us in the chat if you're not following along with this. So here we've got our examples. We've got these these are the types of compensation you can activate from within Fusion. You can do in computer, you can do in control, where, in reverse where, and off. So if we look at in-computer first and the NC code for in-computer, um, if you look down at line N70, you see, you see I've highlighted there X minus 0.5. So that means that line has been output at X minus, oh sorry, it's not 0.5, it's X5, because I've got a 10 millimeter tool. So that's half of the tool it's stepped back over. So it's gonna cut down that line and then the right hand side of the tool in this case is going to cut our finish line. Please say that's making sense. Um, so the right hand side of the tool is going to cut down um, because I've stepped over X5. Let me just jump into Fusion and I'll show you what I've done here, which might make a bit more sense actually. So I've set my datum up in the corner there and then the toolpath is along that line. I've set my datum up there for this toolpath and then the datums along that line so each one of these the line i'm trying to cut is zero is x zero so that's that's sort of where those numbers are coming from so back here you can see that we've got x minus five because it's stepped over five mil to then cut with a 10 mil tool then we've got in control so now you can see we've output from fusion x zero but of course the machine can't cut x0 because it would gouge the part. It's got to step back over in a perfect scenario to x minus 5. But the advantage of cutter comp here is if you cut that and it's slightly too large or slightly too small, you can adjust the value in your tool table to actually bring that back into spec. Because you imagine, once you output from Fusion, that's a static file. It's not going to change unless you've done clever stuff with macros. But that file is not going to change. So if you want to improve the quality of your next part, you need something that will change. And that's what Cutter Comp is. 
Cutacomp's pulling that value from the tool table every time you activate it so you can update your wear and bring the part back into spec by either adding or taking away to push the tool left and right. So imagine here now for the in control scenario. If I've got my tool, di oh, tool radius set to five millimeters, my machine will cut at X minus five. If I change that to 5.1, it's gonna cut at X minus 5.1. If I change it to 4.9, it's gonna cut at X minus 4.9. So it's gonna step over the amount that it needs to do to cut that perfectly every part. And it's gonna give you a parameter that you can then adjust to change the way that NC code runs on the machine. Because the machine is always just gonna cut the same thing over and over again, unless you tell it to do something different. How are we getting on, Spence? Any comments, any confused yeah. people? No confused people. Uh, it's Akash's birthday. Oh, happy birthday, happy birthday Akash. Akash. Thanks for learning on your birthday. Yeah, that's dedication, that is. I wouldn't listen to me on my birthday. And it's me. <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm with you so far. I think it's, uh, to me, Fusion or, and any kind of software will output what you tell it to output. So if you say you're using a 10 millimeter tool, it's going to take that into account. In this compensation, is allowing you to adjust that on the controller to, <laughs> to modify that actual diameter. So let's say you're using a 10 millimeter end mill but in actual fact, you've used that tool for a long time, and it's, it's not actually 10 millimeters, it's 9.8 or 9.9, yeah. and you can adjust for that difference without having to repost all of your code. Exactly. I probably should have explained at the start of all this why we want it more, rather than just going into the, the theory of how it works. Good point that spent. So, yeah, if anyone's struggling to work out why you'd want to use this, please say, and we'll, we'll go over that again. Um, but hopefully this is this is explaining it all. Right, we then got where. So this is a this is a bit of a hybrid between the two. So if you look at the blue line on where, you can see that's the same as in computer. So, but we're then still activating G41. So this is if you don't want to have the full value of the tool diameter or radius in your tool table, if you want it just left at zero and you want to go up and down the little increments then of the where value so in control is full blown it's going to look at the tool radius and anywhere you've got applied to that whereas if you use where it's going to effectively just apply a little value that you've got in there not the whole tool radius and then inverse where because if you look at the bold you'll see i've highlighted um, g41 and g42 so it's either going to go to the left or to the right um, again, the not funny story, but the story that I'm going to share today. About a year ago, I was machining on our Haas VF2 um, with a 16mm end mill. Um, solid carbide, worth an absolute fortune. And I used cutter comp to get the accuracy of my part. I hadn't checked and there was a value of zero in my tool table. So imagine that in control there should offset half of 16 so it would have got back at the value for me it would have got to eight millimeters so minus eight um, and put the cutter in the right right place to just finishing pass but of course because I had zero in there it actually put the center line of the tool straight down my finished part so it gouged eight millimeters out of the part God knows how the tool didn't snap, um, but yeah, so if you are using cutter compensation, please, please, please make sure your tool table is correct and you've got the values in there as you need. If you, they're all just zeros, then you're going to have the same problem that I did and it's just going to gouge the hell out of your part. We then look at off, and that has the same blue line as in control. So the blue line is getting output right where you want it, but it's not activating G41, G42. 
So this is a bit of, we've put it in there to allow people to use it if they know what they're doing. You could potentially do this for things like engraving with, with tipped tools where you want the tip to follow. But then we have got the trace tool path that lets you do that. So it's there, but I imagine it doesn't get highly used. Um, it just allows certain weird scenarios to be accomplished when there's not a dedicated tool path to do that. So I'm going to jump into Fusion and just talk a little bit more about it because I can simulate the toolpath. But please let us know if you've got any questions so far on what's been going on. Are we all good, Spence? Yeah, um, absolutely right. Um, based, we do. Uh, thinks it's neat to learn about G-codes. So I just said that we'll uh, put some useful links in the description mm -hmm. below surrounding G and M codes. Um, for the reference for everyone uh, and that's it so back to you cool okay so let's have a look at in computer let's simulate this so what we can see here if I just look straight down this path actually let's turn it a little because I actually can't see um, and again we can see there the whole thing that the tool is touching on the edge perfectly where I want it and the machine knows its center line and where fusions output the machine center line. So everyone's happy. There's no calculations needed. And in theory, we make a good part. But as we know, sometimes tools deflect, sometimes tools aren't exactly the diameter we asked them for. We actually had this where we sent tools out to be reground. And then of course, when they came back, they were a slightly different diameter. Another thing to think about is if you're regrinding tools, they won't be the same diameter as when you sent them out. Um, if they're touching the flutes, of course, we had the flutes just tickled just to try and sharpen them up again. Um, this is when we were cutting resin, so it wasn't you know, it wasn't a big problem. So that's what we've got there. Fusion outputs spindle center line. The machine works in spindle center line. No one needs a tool table. Everyone's happy. Let's now simulate the next tool path. In control so what's going to happen here is we're going to sorry if I oh, that's an interesting one fusion doesn't simulate fusion simulates tool center line so I can't show the example I was going to show there because I suppose fusion's got to show what the machine does which is move down the center line of the tool so let's just show you on this picture so the tool's going to come down. At this point we see here, at the end of this arc, the tool compensation is going to be applied when I'm moving out to here. So that's that's why you always need a lead-in move. If you don't have a lead-in move, you see here that we will error. The control must have a lead-in move. The reason behind that is, if we didn't have the lead-in move, we'd have to apply the cutter comp from this point to this point, which would give you a diagonal line and gouge your part. So you need a lead in to actually have some room to apply the cutter compensation. Because the cutter compensation gets applied in the plane you're in. So you need to be at that plane, apply the cutter comp, and then you can actually move with that applied. So the cutter fusion is outputting this line here. The machine then needs to transform that back to its center line so it knows where to go. And it uses that value in the tool table to tell it how far to offset back to here. So that's really what we've got is the machine needs to know how to go from this line to this line. And it uses that tool value to offset that much there. And then we look at where where as you see is exactly the same or it looks exactly the same as if i hold control that works um as in con computer that's because we're outputting the center line again and it will just adjust a little value just to move it left or right depending on what you've got in there so make sure you've got the right values because if you've if you do complete tool radius or diameter and where you need to use in control. If you're just putting the where value into your tool table, then you need to use where 
or inverse where depending on if you put positive or negative values in so that's basically what those four are you've got we output center line the machine cut center line we output the edge the machine then transforms that back into center line using the value from the tool table we output center line then the machine transforms that a little bit left or right um, depending on your wear value and then depends on if you use positive or negative numbers is where or inverse where and then off is we output the edge and we don't tell the machine to compensate for it so you imagine there if you didn't compensate for that you would gouge the tool by five millimeters being a 10 mil tool but let's just say you had some weird scenario with an engraving where that was actually what you wanted to do so dare i ask for questions come on everyone i want everyone to go away knowing what this is and if they should or shouldn't be using it um i probably haven't covered that enough actually so you can only use this in 2d contour um what's say only you can use it for the things like 2d chamfer but it doesn't have all the same options we've just got in computer wear and inverse wear we haven't got in control that's because you don't normally have a diameter on a chamfer tool because it's a tiny tip or you know it's a effectively it's a, a slope so you don't know what diameter you're cutting on so you can't use the, the whole diameter value for that um, but it's mainly used on 2d contour over here in the compensation type and that's because you know the 2d contour is that um, planar finishing toolpath it's what you use to finish off um, important features so that's why you apply it on the finishing toolpaths and again you want to apply it every time you want to be able to tweak and adjust I mean I've seen people that go in here measure the part the parts a little bit too big so they put a, a radial stop to leave it I'm like don't don't do it don't do it just go in here and put in control and start doing it from parameter driven on the control Gross, what you have to do is you have to go back to fusion every time and start changing this value and it's just a nightmare so if you're one of those people don't do it use compensation if you've got it available go on spence oh, horrify me with everyone's comments no there, there isn't really anything i think people are really understanding it and taking it all on board i think one really good use for in control is let's say you programmed a part using uh, a 10 millimeter ml for example and then you get down to the machine and either your 10 millimeter tools come missing or you know you, you need to use a 12 for whatever reason or 14 even because you've used in control you don't need to repost all your code you can just adapt that number in your table on your controller and then you can use the 14, you can use the 8, you can use the 10 if you have it. And so by determining the diameter of the tool on the controller, it saves you having to repost if like, a, let's say you had a tool breakage. If you were doing it in computer, now you've got to go in to Fusion, you've got to change the tool, you've got to repost all that code. In control, you don't have to do any of that because your diameter of your tool is controlled by the controller. Yeah, perfect. Cause, yeah, because Fusion's outputting the, the finished edge, not outputting the center line of the tool. Because so the finished edge doesn't change no matter what tool you use, but the, 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 yeah. the center line of the cutter changes on every tool you use then. Just if Absolutely. you if you are doing what Spencer just said, just be careful if you step up too much in diameter remember those lead in moves and the lead out moves aren't compensated so you can't put a 50 mil tool in where you programmed it as a 10 mil infusion because you'll just gouge on that lead in move where it's applying the compensation absolutely um and then in my head in control where and inverse where are kind of the same right so you're determining the diameter of the tool or, or the end diameter of the tool in the controller yeah. you're just changing what type of number you input whether you input the whole diameter in the case of in control or whether you're tweaking the diameter that fusion outputs yeah. by 
a smaller wear number. Exactly. So basically, in control is doing the whole hog. You know, it's going there and it's doing the the radius and the wear, and then the wear and inverse wear is just doing the wear. So you've just got to choose what really works best for for your machine, your application, your controller, and how how it wants to work really. Um, but if you're doing anything finishing pass wise, doing some decent tolerancing on parts, this is really useful. And I want to quickly um, show something now. I've held off so long about doing probing on a live stream, but anyone who knows me knows that that is my specialism. Um, if that's the right word, specialism probably isn't. But um, I'm just going to quickly grab the probe here from the tool library. Um, and I'm going to choose that side there. I'm going to go into my Actions tab, Update Toolware, select a reference operation. So select what just cut that, which was that toolpath, and hit OK. And what's going to happen is now I'm going to cut that edge. I'm then using the cutter compensation. I'm then going to probe that edge. And if it's out of the minimum threshold so if I put in 0 0.01 if it's anything above 10 microns it's going to then update the toolware live on the controller and then you can recut as well then there if probing is something you want to hear more about please tell me you'll make my day um, I've really held off doing any probing talk because Spencer knows that I would this would have to be a day live stream not an hour's live stream if we get into probing but yeah, if you do want to learn more about probing, let me know and I'll be happy to oblige. So that's why you can use Cutter Comp as well. You see, you can start to use your probes to update those parameters on the machine. You know, if you're doing thousands of parts, why aren't you doing this? You know, this is what you should be doing. You should cut the parts, probe it. Yes, you can't change what you've just cut unless you want to recut, but you improve the quality of the next part you make. And, you know, if your machine's reliable enough, it will mean that you never get to the point of having a scrap part because you're just improving it every time you go. So, yeah, how are we doing? Have we got any burning questions? There's a few. Um, Carl re really, really, really wants you to uh, do a probing live stream. Okay, that's that's coming up then. Um, you've just unleashed the beast, Carl. <laughs> Hope you're happy. Uh, so what, we've got a couple of questions for you, Rich. Uh, what happens if the value you put in, and I'm assuming he's talking about where or in control here, uh, ends up being inaccurate? So you've obviously, he's, he's measured the tool, um, obviously quite inaccurately. What impact does that have? On you your... effectively overcut or undercut. So look back at my example of having a 16 millimeter diameter tool in the spindle and the radius set at zero, you don't get much more inaccurate than that. So I overcut by eight millimeters and gouged the hell out the part. So yeah, you've got to make sure the values you have in the control are right. It would have exactly the same effect as if you're you know, doing what we do normally and using computer, and you've specified a 10 mil tool in Fusion, and you use a 20 mil tool on your machine, you're going to gouge the part. It's exactly the same scenario. I hope that answers Perfect. it. Yeah, definitely. Um, got a question about a DIY machine. Um, cool. Paul is asking for some advice um, using Mac 3. Um, what would you suggest for him using Mac 3? He can see where being a good option. Yeah, I, I've never used Mac 3, so I'm not going to pretend to know about it. I'd have a look at your tool table um, and see where would be a very nice way of, of getting into using Cutter Comp. Because if you get it wrong, you're only going to be wrong by the wear amount rather than by the tool radius and the wear amount. So let's say you've got a 10mm tool in and you put 0 0.1 of wear in. If you get it wrong, you can be 5.1mm out if you're using control. If you get it wrong with where you're going to be 0.1 so it's just a little bit safer if you're not quite sure which one to use um, but it has got that little bit of flexible inflexibility where you know you're still outputting the center so if you do any major changes it can cause problems 
by where the leading and lead outs come in. So I don't want to get into the full pros and cons against doing in control versus wear and inverse wear, but for you it might be better to start just putting that wear value in, in there. Perfect. I have a quick question for you, Rich. Ooh. We don't have any more questions on here yet, but it's... I've got a quick question for you. So the off option interests yeah. me a little bit. Um, I guess, is the off option center line cutting? And what I mean by that, it cuts with the tool on the center of whatever geometry you're selecting. Yes. So that might be useful for if you're using not necessarily an end mill, but maybe like a chamfer mill in this situation. Yeah, the, the problem with that then is if we go back to the chamfering live stream we did, you're cutting right on that tip, which is not not good. But I've seen it used in the past for doing some like weird engraving type things where the engrave function didn't do quite what they were after. They wanted to follow lines, but I personally would try and use trace rather than this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's there. There are probably good scenarios for it that I can't think of at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's going to be for people that want effectively exactly what they select in Fusion, the tool to follow that line exactly, not step to the left or to the right of that line. Perfect. Are we all sorted then, Spence? Yeah, no more questions on the chat. I lost you for a second there. I hope that was just me. It might um, well. So, sorry if anyone oh, else lost this, will, this is a perfect question for you, and I think I've heard you talking about this before. Um, 3D printing. Okay. Compensate. Oh, this bugs me, but go on. So does would this uh, apply in a 3D printing... Uh, situation right i don't know enough about 3d printers to give an absolute statement here but when i've used 3d printers before it really annoys me that i can't do this i don't know if that's just because i'm using them wrong or they don't support cutter compensation but for me this would be amazing in 3d printers if you could effectively is it called the bead width or something whatever or the nozzle width um you know if you could offset by that to get the perfect edge um, someone please correct me um, I've never I, I mean I say I've never got it to work I've never tried to get it to work so you've got to try to really say it doesn't work but but yeah um, I think this would be amazing for 3D printers so if anyone out there has got a 3D printer and has got cutter compensation to work do the 3D printers controllers even know what G41 and 42 are I don't know so I haven't got an answer for you, but I've got a challenge for anyone out there. Yeah, if, if you do know, we'd love to hear, um, obviously not in the live chat, but in the, in the uh, comment section. Yeah. So, yeah, let us know, let us know about the 3D printing cut conversation. It'd be interesting to hear everyone's thoughts, for sure. That's fine. And while you're there, give the video a like. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you press that little bell icon, then every time we have a live stream, you're going to get notified. And no one's going to miss another amazing Rich and Spence live stream. Yeah. So make sure you ring that bell. Perfect. And last thing before we go, before I let you all have your day back, um, I just wanted to say earlier that that's the tool number there, that's the length offset, that's the diameter offset. So if you do want to change them in your tool library, post-processor, they all default the same, so if I start moving those up, they do, but then I can make that whatever I like it as well. So it tends to only be if you've got a huge tool management system that you start having different length wares to numbers. But yeah, that's effectively what it is. Right, that is me done. If they're all done on the questions, then I think we're sorted, aren't we, Spence? Yeah, it looks like no more questions. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Uh, let us hear your ideas for future live streams in the comment section. Yeah. Uh, we love doing these live streams, coming up with the ideas of what people want to hear yeah. about. It's the hardest bit. So let us know in the comment section below what you'd like us to do a live stream on. And the one that gets the most thumbs up or 
gets the most votes, we'll do that um, very short. Yeah. And I'm on holiday next week, so it might be Wednesday we do this. Because I'm away Thursday, Friday. So if you do like tuning in every Thursday, it might become Wednesday next week. But watch out and we'll put the dates on soon. Cheers, everyone. See you again soon.